Hello and welcome back to the Master Engineer Podcast. I am your host Sotek Andre and this is episode 8 in which I'm about to be joined by Dr. Aaron Horshig, a physical therapist, strength and conditioning coach and the founder of Squat University to discuss squatting for physique development. During our conversation we discuss a variety of topics related to this um, concept including but not limited to the influence of bar position, stance and depth of muscle recruitment, the impact of anatomy on how your squats will look, whether you can target certain parts of your quads by varying things like um, toe angle or stance width and um, Aaron also gives a very thorough biomechanical breakdown of why categorizing squats as either quad or hip dominant might be misguided. Given that Aaron has a, an Olympic weightlifting background and um, he is currently a physical therapist, our opinions might not uh, be the same on many of these topics and I certainly don't agree with everything he says but I still um, recommend listening to this episode with an open mind and um, if you're interested in my own thoughts and um, some of the conclusions I took from this episode stick around to the end. So without further ado, let's get into episode 8 of the Muscle Engineer podcast with Dr. Aaron Horshig. Aaron Horshig, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. So we are going to talk today squats for physique development. And just to give people a bit of background into your uh, fascination with the squat, where did that come from? How did that get started? Definitely. So I've been involved in strength and conditioning and sort of barbell sports probably since since high school. I really got introduced to it when I was playing football. And then as I went on to my undergraduate degree, um, you know, I quit playing the traditional sports, football, baseball, and I found the first uh, Olympic weightlifting club at my university, Truman State University, which is a fairly small school in uh, northeastern Missouri in the United States. And then um, from there, you know, I just fell in love with it. Uh, I loved competing. I loved training for Olympic weightlifting. And that really became the backbone to, you know, sort of branching out and learning about all the other aspects that has to go with barbell training. From there, I went on to get my degree, my doctorate in physical therapy or physiotherapy as it's called everywhere else in the United or outside of the United States. And I really, really started to see sort of this emerging trend with athletes that were getting injured is during some part of our initial evaluation, I would sit down and I would ask them, you know, show me just a very simple thing. Show me a body weight squat. Show me a single leg squat as a part of our examination to sort of find out why is this person having pain. And I found this sort of deja vu like thing that would happen over and over again is you would see these athletes that were extremely strong in every sense of the word, you know, and they would be able to squat and lift and perform, you know, very heavily during their training uh, process and during their competition. Yet for some reason, they were still developing injuries. And I found that a lot of times they couldn't perform the most basic movement of a squat. They could do a lot of other basic movements well, but they couldn't perform a squat well. So it sort of was something that sort of was sort of almost like a light bulb going off in your head. I would see it over and over. And it's these athletes that everyone would look at them and say, wow, that, that athlete's very strong. They're fat, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger than other athletes. Yet why are they getting injured? And I saw it was an inability to perform the most basic movements of the squat. And I always say, you know, the squat is a movement ever before it's an exercise. So my whole goal with Squat University and what I tried to do is educate others on how important it is to perform the most simple movements in the squat is obviously suffer from an inability to perform. And it just sort of went on from there. That I've tried to use as a form to help educate our uh, others, empower others. That it, let's talk about movement. Let's talk about technique. Let's talk about perfecting this most basic movement that you hit all athletes. I don't care if you play American football. I don't care if you play, you know, football, soccer, as we call it here. I don't care if you play basketball. I don't care if you're a weightlifter, a powerlifter, a crossfitter. Everyone squats. Whether it's a bodyweight squat, whether it's a barbell squat, it's almost that universal movement that everyone does. And it's something that I feel that if you can perfect at a technical basis, it's going to have carryover into all other aspects of your training. Not only, I think, will you perform better in other aspects of your training, but I think that you will feel better because your body will be working in sync and you're going to have less injury 
And that's really what it's all about is being able to find sort of, I call your true strength, not only the ability to be strong, to be able to lift a lot of weight, but also to be able to do so pain-free for the rest of your life. And I think it all stems, like I said, from the ability to perform a squat from a movement first and then as an exercise second. So then in your mind, there's really, really no question that uh, everyone should perform some sort of a, of a free weight squat, right? Really, yeah. I, I don't think that there is ever... I mean, obviously, there's going to be cases with those that have certain you know abnormalities in the way that their body was built, or maybe they don't. There, there's going to be those that may not fit into the category of needing to do a free weight squat. But for a large, large majority, every single person, I believe, should be free weight squatting. You know, does that mean every single person should be trying to load up 900 pounds on the bar? Maybe not. But I really think every single person would benefit from a free weight squat. I, For example, you know, I have athletes of all ages that come in to see me as a physical therapist dealing with injury. I don't care what sport they're playing. They're going to do some form of a, of a barbell or a, uh, a weighted squat, maybe holding a kettlebell. I will have those who don't play sports anymore. I'm talking your grandma who is 88 years old. You know, if she's dealing with some sort of back pain or knee pain or hip pain, she's going to be doing some form of a resisted squat as a part of her eventual rehabilitative and exercise program because it relates to so many things. Let's talk just outside of, you know, training. We're talking about training for life too. If you go out in your garage and you need to be able to lift a heavy box or move something, you know, you're going to be moving in a squat movement. So being able to tolerate and be able to resist your body uh, breaking down under a load in a movement that appears like a squat, you know, the barbell squat has many applications, not only in the weight room, but also lots of the weight room. What do you think about the statement that many people seem to make that everyone should barbell squat? You know that you have to barbell squat no matter what it is that your goals are. And maybe specifically just to address the topic that I'm concerned about really um, for leg size and leg strength, especially for leg size. Does everyone have to barbell back squat? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I don't, I, I think the barbell back squat is undoubtedly the king of all exercises. I mean, you can load more weight on the barbell back squat than almost any other exercise and have a such a, a tremendous change in your body as far as hormonal responses, the, you know, the load, it, the barbell back squat loads your entire body and it's different than just your traditional deadlift. Does everyone have to do it? I, I don't think everyone has to do it. I, there's always going to be exceptions, you know. I think some people love to front squat. I think some people, when they put a bar on their back, for example, let's say someone has a history of back injury. Maybe putting a bar on their back is A, uncomfortable, or B, it just technically they cannot get it. They've maybe got uh, mobility restrictions or some sort of pain that does not have to do a barbell back squat. They get a lot of benefit out of performing a front squat. Or maybe that person has uh, an injury to where they can't even hold a bar on their back, but they can hold uh, a kettlebell in front of them so they can perform a weighted goblet squat. I don't like to ever use absolutes in saying that everyone has to do one thing or the other. I think the absolute of almost everyone needing to do a resisted squat is very, very key for most, but I don't think necessarily saying everyone has to back squat. I think um, I saw an article on the internet the other day where they were talking about a couple elite weightlifters that maybe did not perform back squats often in their training. Now, I think that's going to be uh, a very small group of people that will do that because I think almost everyone in the sport of weightlifting will perform the back squat as a part of their training. Some people, they may not like it. They may not... Uh, enjoy how it feels on their back. Maybe they don't feel like they get as much benefit out of it. So I don't think there's going to be absolutes in saying everyone has to back squat. But by far, some form of resisted squat is going to be key for almost every single person. Right. So um, one of the ways most people kind of classify squats are quad versus hip dominant squats. And you've, <laughs> you've written a great article on this topic. And usually the way this is assessed so to speak, on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, is usually people draw a vertical line over the midfoot and they kind of split the body into two sides, what's on the, on the left and what's on the right of that line. And then what if that, for example, there is more thing on the left, then that's a quad dominant squat because you have more 
forward knee travel and then if more of the body is on the right side then that's the hip dominant squat because more of your body weight is kind of shifted backwards could you please explain a bit why maybe that's uh, incorrect definitely so first off let's talk about the first part is um when people use um diagnostic lines they'll draw lines on the body to see sort of where the body lies is it more knee dominant or hip dominant so that part necessarily isn't wrong so when you look at the body diagnostically sports scientists when they go to do a biomechanical comparison of the body during a squat they will draw a line down the middle of the body from the barbell drawing straight down. So ideally when we squat, we wanna see the barbell track over the middle of our foot. So this means our body is relatively in balance. Most of the barbell weight is gonna be centered directly uh, over where it hits on your back. So if the barbell remains over your middle of your foot, you're usually in balance. But what we find is that if you draw that line straight down, it sort of bisects, sort of cuts in half your thigh. Now from there, you can take from that vertical line of gravity pulling down on the barbell, from that line to the uh, knee joint is going to be your lever arm of your knee. So what your quads work, your quads extend the knee. The line that uh, cuts in half that barbell all the way down to the middle of your foot, that line vertically to your hip joint is called your hip lever arm. Now, just like taking a wrench and pulling a bolt, usually the longer the lever is of that, basically the longer your wrench is, the more torque you can produce. Torque is a rotational force. So if you have a long, let's say you're doing a front squat. As you squat down and you take a freeze frame sort of photo of your body as you hit like a parallel squat, you will have usually a longer lever arm. You're going to have more forward knee translation than let's say a low bar back squat. So you're going to have a longer lever arm at your knee and then that low bar back squat is going to have a shorter lever arm at your knee. Now, what that means scientifically is that a front squat is going to have more torque generally placed on the knee joint than what. Conversely, the low bar back squat is going to have more torque placed on the hip than the front squat. So a lot of people will take that and think that the just because there's more torque placed on a joint that the muscles that surround that joint are working harder. And that's where the the problem in how we view the body sort of comes into place. So if you take your arm and you raise a dumbbell in front of you, there's a long lever arm. Now, in order to hold it up there, your deltoids, your big shoulder muscles have to work pretty hard. If you have more torque, let's say you're holding a 20 pound or 20 kilo dumbbell in front of you versus a 10, uh, there's obviously going to be more torque, which means that the deltoids have to work longer or work harder. However, your lower legs, your body doesn't work the exact same way in a squat. And what we find is this is called Lombard's paradox. And it's referring to a theory by a biomechanist by the name of W.B. Lombard, and this dates all the way back to the early 1900s, and he was doing a lot of research into the way that the body uses two joint muscles or biarticulate muscles to propel itself. So whenever you walk, run, or jump, your body has a sort of a fascinating way of using muscles that span two joints. So if you look at your body on the front side of your body, your thigh, you have one in two joint muscles. And what I mean by that, you've got your vastus muscles, your vastus lateralis, your vastus medialis. Those are muscles on the front side of your body, your quads. Those only cross one joint. They start midway up your thigh and they cross at the knee joint, at your quad tendon and patellar tendon. Well, you've also got two joint muscles. So you've got your rectus femoris. Not only does that cross your knee joint, but it connects all the way up at your hip joint. So it is technically a two joint muscle or a bi-articulate connecting in over two joints. Now, what that means is that your vastus muscles, the one joint muscles, form knee extension. So if you go to kick a soccer ball, the knee going from a bent to an extended position that is performed by your vastus muscles. It also is performed by your rectus muscle of your quad. However, because the rectus also crosses two joints, it can also affect the hip. So it can bring your thigh closer to your body. It can flex your hip joint. On the back side of your body, same thing. So you have your glutes, your big butt muscles. Those extend 
your hip joint, so it brings your leg backwards. The glutes are a one joint muscle, so they only cross the hip joint. Well, you also have your hamstrings on the back side of your body, like your semitendinosus. That is a biarticulate or two joint muscle, so it crosses not only your hip, but it crosses your knee joint. What this means is that it can also aid the glutes in extending the hip, but it can also flex the knee joint, so it can bring your heel towards your butt. What happens is that during a squat, when you are doing it in balance, as you raise up and come up from the bottom of the squat, as you ascend, the knees and the hips extend at the same rate. And what that means is that the muscles that cross two joints, on the front side, your rectus, on the back side, your hamstrings, they don't change in length. They shorten on one side and they lengthen on the other. So basically, they stay the same length on the ascent of the squat. And our body does a funny thing is it basically uses those two joint muscles to help transfer force between the body. So they almost act, those muscles almost act as tendons in that they don't change in length, but it allows muscles on one side of the body that do not directly come in contact with the other side to indirectly help that muscle out on the other side of the body. So for example, on the ascent of a front squat, your quads can indirectly, via the biarticulate muscles that cross the back side of the leg, help extend the glutes. Now all of this requires those muscles the hamstrings and the rectus to stay at a constant length. So if you have a technique issue in that, you know, maybe your hips rise excessively fast, we call that a good morning or a stripper squat. Then obviously we disrupt Lombard's paradox and you're not going to have that equal force transfer. So going back to our original question, if you have a front squat where there's a ton of torque placed on the knee relative to a low bar back squat, does it work the quads more? And the answer is no. And it's because even though there's more torque placed on the knee joint, that doesn't mean the quads are working more. It just means that the glutes are indirectly helping overcome that external rotation force at the knee joint by transferring a little bit more force there. There's been a lot of research done that has shown that a front squat and a back squat does not have any difference in force or uh, I would say the max voluntary uh, contraction rate of the quads or the glutes or the hamstrings between the two. Now, yes, there's a couple other factors that can change that, and that's going to be weight on the bar or depth of the squat, but relative depth, if we go parallel squat to parallel squat or deep squat to deep squat and relative weight on the bar, you're not going to see a difference between the two and that's because your body is able to transfer force from one joint to the other to make up for it now some people will always say well I feel front squats in my quads more versus my hamstrings well everyone feels different things uh, as far as their soreness the next day I have people that say that the next day after a heavy back squats they'll feel their their adductors their groin muscles working like crazy they'll be very sore there whereas others will do the exact same workout and say they feel their butt muscles working hard so really soreness in a particular muscle group isn't necessarily a great indicator that those muscles work harder it just means that that's where you've maybe required the most effort compared to the rest of your body as far as your fatigue levels go but they were still working very hard compared to the other ones yeah i <laughs> i remember when i first came across this it was a bit uh hard to wrap my mind around it and honestly the way you just described it is still a bit uh, tough to imagine or to believe that a uh, front squat for example when the torso is essentially almost vertical and the uh, bent over lane norton style uh, low bar back squat is going to have the same quad building effects then there is also the anecdotal evidence that I personally wouldn't discard at all from decades of bodybuilders who would say that, for example, and I know many people who are extremely, extremely knowledgeable when it comes to muscle growth, they will say things like, um, well, I don't back squat because my butt is already pretty huge, or I use a front squat because I need to bring up my quads more. So um, do you know by any chance if there are some sort of uh, any long-term actual muscle growth measuring studies i mean actual interventional 12 week 16 week studies where the outcome was actual muscle growth instead of just uh, an emg or something like that uh nothing that i have seen specifically right because that would be for me personally a big drawback because 
if you take a truly evidence-based uh, <laughs> uh, approach, then anecdotal evidence in the field would, would still be a part of that evidence. So I'm not discrediting at all what you're saying. I'm just kind of trying to think of what someone else might offer back as a counter argument mm -hmm. and and here's another thing you you have to you have to bring into account is also the weights relative weights used on different exercises in the depth for example if you take uh the glutes the glutes are continuing to turn on the deeper you squat your quads on the other hand are maximally uh engaged at about a parallel squat so if you're using the same weight in a back squat versus a front squat and your squat you only bring to a parallel position, you'll never be working the glutes as much as the quads no matter what squat you're doing. If you are doing a back squat and you know, you're only squatting to parallel versus a front squat and you're squatting to parallel, those quads are going to be working much more relative to the back squat because you've never gotten the full amount of work out of the glutes because you're not reaching full depth. So you also have to bring that into account is that, especially with the number of bodybuilders who may have that type of, of feel that they're only working their quads more in a front squat. Well, you have to look at a number of things. You have to look at the weight that they're using on the bar comparative to the back squat. And you have to look at how deep they were bringing their back squats as well. And also, um, you also have to understand that the quads really are a, a huge driver of the squat in general. In most squats, you know, they're also, they're turned on to a much greater degree. The back squat or just the squat in general, the glutes really don't reach a, a very high max voluntary contraction until the weight is very high and is very deep. Yeah, that's very interesting because I remember Brad Schoenfeld, I actually have the screenshot on my phone somewhere sharing some EMG data and <laughs> actually the thing was that uh, glutes had very low activation in a deep squat, which is funny. Compared to the front squat, yes. I believe the front squat, and uh, these are just you know numbers I'm trying to remember from the last time I read one, the quads were, were activated already up in the 80s and 90s percent of their max voluntary contraction at a certain weight. And at that weight, the glutes were only turned on at about like 70 to 75 percent of their max voluntary contraction. So relatively, they're not turned on as much, which is why I think some people probably feel like their quads are probably working harder because, you know, compared to their max ability to contract, yes, they are. Interesting, yeah. And the other thing is that many people, for example, I'm sure you know Mike Israel. Yes. He is a very big fan of deep squats. Mm -hmm. And I certainly experienced this too, that when I go, well, all the way down, whatever that point is for me or for someone else, usually that results in a deeper stretch and um, bigger soreness the next day, which oh, yes. again, we can argue what that means for long-term muscle growth. But it's certainly interesting. And it seems to me that this whole topic is certainly far from being, um, far from being fully understood and settled oh it's very true and it's it's something that we're going to need more more research on and it's you know as as someone who is anyone really who reads research you know nothing is ever necessarily 100 percent solved or figured out you know there's always more evidence coming out and so the beauty of science is that we can always find out something you know down the road that maybe changes our mind you know and as a scientist or someone who bases their theories in science, if you're not open to the fact that someday your opinion may be uh, proved wrong with more evidence that comes out, then you know that's 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 the beauty of the thing. So we we may find out much more, uh, you know, down the line that there's things that we didn't know that now we know, and it changes our opinion on how the squat is used. Yeah, um, definitely, and that's what essentially being evidence-based means: keep an open mind and. Being, able, being willing to change your exactly. stance on things. So you've mentioned a couple of um, things that might affect muscle recruitment. So maybe let's take them one at a time and see what you think about them. So we already uh, touched a bit on uh, bar position. So when we could compare a front squat, a high bar or a low bar back squat or a safety squat bar, which seems uh, it's getting more popular these days, at least from what I've seen. Because essentially it's uh, kind of allows you to use more weight than a front squat, but it's also much uh, much more comfortable for your shoulders than a back squat would be. So what do you think? Does shifting bar position itself 
maybe just to keep things uh, levels, keep depth the same, just for the sake of the argument. Does shifting simply bar position affect muscle recruitment significantly? You know, I, I think if you're just talking about like a front squat to a back squat, I don't think you're going to get a crazy amount of difference in muscle recruitment. I think if you go possibly sort of at the end ranges of extremes, where if you go maybe uh, sort of the west side powerlifting style back squat, where you're getting a ton of posterior chain, you know, recruitment and really leaning back and a very bent over squat. Or if you go, you'll see some people do the a front squat where their knees are just completely in front of their toes. They're almost on their toes. I think that's where you're really going to see extreme changes in muscle recruitment. I think with just your normal back squat to front squat, from the research I've, I've read, you know, similar weights, I don't think you're going to see a ton of difference in muscle recruitment specifically. Now, you know, I, I think, again, the things that are going to change muscle recruitment is going to be relative weight on the bar, depth of the squat, your stance width can also change muscle recruitment, not necessarily in the quads versus the glutes, but in terms of the amount that the adductors, your groin muscles are turned on, and toe out angle, I think, has shown a little bit of difference as well with uh, the degree that like your adductors are turned on. So if someone has maybe a straightforward foot squat versus a maybe up to, I believe, a 30 degree toe out angle is going to significantly increase the amount that the adductors are brought into the picture. But as far as over 30 degrees, I don't think there's any significant increase in activation of the of the adductors. Yeah, um, you've mentioned, I think, or at least alluded to um, someone's anthropometrics, <laughs> their anatomy. For example, someone like, um, I've seen you share a couple of videos. There's an Armenian guy, Armenian weightlifting or something like that on Instagram. He, he has an almost identical looking high bar and front squat. So in his case, yeah. But for example, someone who has very long femur and um, they just have to bend over a lot to keep the bar over their center of gravity, then for that person, yeah, it may be a big uh, shift to replace that uh, low bar or that high bar with the front squat. Yeah, you know, anatomy is going to play a huge role in how your squat looks. If you have someone who has very long femurs, uh, very short torso, their squat's going to be looking very different than who has shorter femurs and maybe a little bit longer torso. That's why, you know, it, it's really hard for a lot of people to grasp this, but you cannot necessarily compare how your squat, your cleans, how your snatches are going to look compared to someone who whose body just looks very different. I know a lot of people will say, oh, I wish I could have a front squat like uh, some of the Chinese and, you know, where they're basically straight up and down as far as their torso angle. Well, it's because those athletes that you're pointing out, their anatomy allows them to get into that position where if you have an extremely long femur to torso ratio, it's going to be very different. And it all comes down in the end to sort of finding what's right for your body. A, you have to take into account the first thing you need to look for is, is the bar staying over your midfoot? Because that's going to dictate whether or not your body's in balance. And in doing so, your body then has to accommodate in order to maintain that balanced body. So for some people, that's going to mean a more uh, angled torso forward uh, in order to remain in balance. You know, from then, if you want to modify it, you have to look at different things like your ankle mobility and whatnot, being able to allow maybe more knee over toe in order to get that more upright torso if that's what your goal is. But uh, anatomy is going to play a huge role. Um, if we're talking about, you know, your toe out angle or your stance width, you know, if we look at someone's hip sockets, the way they're aligned, some people will have what we call femoral retroversion or antroversion. Basically, their femurs in the way that they connect to the hip sockets can be at a more forward or flattened angle. Um, we can have acetabular retroversion or antroversion. Basically, the hip sockets, the acetabulum, the way that they are aligned on the pelvis, they may be more forward, they may be more angled flat. And again, that's going to change the way that someone stands because if you have two different people who have completely different anatomy there's no way that their squat widths or their toe out angles are going to be the exact same so again a lot of people will use something that they see on social media and they'll say oh i want to squat just like that but maybe that's not right for their body and if you push your body against your something that's not right for your body 
your body's going to push back and you're not going to be comfortable. You're not going to feel right and you're not, you're not going to perform to the best of your ability. Oh yeah, absolutely. So just to end this topic of bar positions, it would seem to me that ultimately if you look at someone's squat and you kind of draw that imaginary line, it would still be pretty useful to choose a squat that would allow a more upright torso for them. If your goal is, for example, a quad development even if theoretically the advantage might not be because it seems to me that again these comparisons are made kind of in between person so for example two people you change around the bar position but as we said if you have a person for whom one bar position might come naturally and allow them to keep a more upright torso i would be hard pressed to imagine that would not be better for their quad growth i think the big thing is if if your goal is to strictly look for quad development in my opinion yes squatting is going to be sort of your number one go-to you're going to want to increase weight on the bar because weight's going to positively affect how much those quads are turned on get your squats done but then also you know think about what you're exercise two, three, or four is in your training program and make sure those are very quad emphasized. You know, make sure you're doing your seated knee extensions, make sure you're maybe doing your Bulgarian split squats, different things like that to be able to emphasize more of a very quad dominant movement comparatively. But yeah, I, I think weight, making sure that your technique is on point is going to be huge in, in your squat, no matter what technique you're using, really. Yeah, definitely. Because just as an example for myself, I, I started squatting recently because I usually have this uh, love-hate relationship with squats because I put them back in and then get frustrated and abandon them. And now I, I want to keep them in just for the sake of getting better at them. But if you talk about strictly trying to grow my quads, which are not a priority, but if they were, for me, nothing replaced is the hex squat because with those I can keep a bit more narrow stance and I feel every single inch in my quads and the back squat is still it's still great but for example I did yesterday two working sets after warm-ups and my glutes are sore as hell so they are an overall better overall leg exercise but just for quads the hex squat is best for me so you alluded a bit uh, earlier to ankle mobility how does heel elevation change muscle recruitment because most people would think that uh, it increases quad recruitment but I've seen a study recently that showed that it only increased um, calf recruitment. So I think the gastrox involvement, which is a bit interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, so whenever you whenever you put a raised heel on, so a regular weightlifting shoe, it changes the length tension relationship in some of the muscles that in the lower leg, the calf region, because they're less put on tension. Um, which is why wearing a weightlifting shoe can help improve ankle mobility. Some of the muscles of the calf will be put less on tension whenever you raise it off the ground a little bit. What a weightlifting shoe is going to do is it's going to change your technique by allowing more knee over toe translation theoretically, which is going to help you have more upright chest. This is why weightlifters use a weightlifting shoe. For one reason, you're able to keep a more upright torso, so it's going to help you uh, with your efficiency in the clean and the snatch. Again, when you have a weightlifting shoe and you're, let's say you're performing a front squat or a back squat, because the knee is going over the toe a little bit more, theoretically, you're going to have a little bit more torque placed on the knee joint. But again, just like we talked about with Lombard's Paradox, whenever you have a balanced squat, just because there's more torque on the knee joint doesn't necessarily mean that the quads are going to be activated more so in order to perform that squat. The glutes are still going to be able to indirectly help extend the knee. So... Yes, there's going to be more torque placed on that joint, maybe less on the hip joint, but I don't believe it would significantly alter quad activation or significantly decrease glute activation from a biomechanical standpoint from one squat to the other. Interesting, because... Um... Many people have started using those squat wedges. I don't know if you've seen them. Oh, are you talking about just like the regular sort of big wedge that people put next to the squat rack? Yeah, I, I've seen that. Uh, I don't know if I'm as, I mean, I think it's just a more commercialized way of putting a small plate underneath your heels, you know, a weightlifting plate. Uh, I think ideally, if you're going to do anything, I'd rather have you probably squat with a weightlifting shoe. I think it's going to be a little bit more stable and secure than actually standing on a wedge, personally. Yeah, although the advantage with those is that they come in uh, different uh, well, angles and whatever angle you take, the wedge is in a diagonal angle, basically. So you can stand a bit higher on that if you need more ankle uh, support, I guess, will help. Although probably <laughs> it would be better to work on your ankle mobility if you need like three inches of race. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That That's one thing that I 
I, I think a lot of people, they uh, they automatically assume that they have good ankle mobility because they uh, are able to squat fairly deep. But if you never really work on your ankle mobility outside of wearing a weightlifting shoe, you may be very misinformed. Ankle mobility is probably one of the most important mobility aspects to performing a good looking squat. You know, every single person should be able to sit down without any shoes on in a very deep body weight squat and feel very comfortable. In order to do that, you have to have good ankle mobility. Now, a number of people that are in the sport of weightlifting that use weightlifting shoes all the time with a raised heel, they may not know that they have poor ankle mobility because they always use a shoe and almost use it as a crutch in order to perform a squat. So that's why one of the first things I do as an assessment when I'm evaluating an athlete for whatever I'm, you know, whether they're in pain or maybe just a movement issue is I get them out of their weightlifting shoes and I ask them, you know, show me a deep bodyweight squat with your toes straight forward to just make sure that they have adequate ankle mobility. When you don't have good ankle mobility, it affects other things all the way up your body. Your hips are going to have to pull into your body. We call that the butt wink. Your back may have to round. It may be less visible when you put on a pair of weightlifting shoes because you're sort of raising your heel up and taking a little pressure off your body from showing full adequate ankle mobility. But Ankle mobility is still extremely important to have other than just during your performance because it will uh, limit your potential for what positions you can get into. Yeah, that uh, squat you mentioned with toes pointing forward, holy holy cow, that requires a ton of uh, ankle mobility. It does. And that's the thing is, you know, when I'm screening an athlete, I want to see their ability to perform a deep bodyweight squat with toes straight forward because it does require so much mobility. When you pick up a barbell, my goal is that you can then perform to your greatest capabilities. And what that means for some people is turning their toes out a little bit. I'm okay with you turning your toes out a little bit when you're going to barbell back squat because I don't want you to butt up or push up against your mobility restrictions that you may have. I still want you to work on those mobility restrictions and do, you know, at least a good 15, 20 minutes worth of mobility work every day. But when it comes time to pick up the barbell, I don't want you then trying to really focus on pushing into those positions that you may not fully have in your capabilities. So turning those toes out a little bit can be very helpful in that. But your end goal should be, again, like we talked about when we first started this conversation, movement first, then performance. And if you don't have the movement down first, your performance will never be what it can be because it's unsupported by a faulty pattern. So if you look at like a pyramid that we see in Egypt, the, the pyramids have a very wide wide base and then it goes up and tapers the base of your personal pyramid is your movement quality how well you can move if that base is very small you know if you saw a pyramid that's got a really tiny base and then bows out really fat at the top obviously you can tell it's not very supported well so a storm comes through it's going to tip over well the same thing happens with your body if you don't move well first, if you don't have the capability to sit down into a good deep squat, you don't have adequate mobility, you don't have adequate stability, your movement patterns aren't very good, your technique isn't very good, your body is an unsupported pyramid and it is set up to eventually topple over, which is where injury comes into the picture. Isn't that highly dependent on uh, anatomy though? Like as you mentioned, hip anatomy and... Mm -hmm. Yes. And now I will say this, when I say a straightforward foot bodyweight squat, I'm talking to a very, very high percentage of people that should be capable of that. There will be some that they'll have to naturally turn their toes out a little bit. Those with femoral retroversion and antiversion. That's a, a much smaller degree of people. But again, why I think it's important to have a screening performed by someone, if it's just not feeling right, you know, having someone that understands how to screen the anatomy to understand whether or not this is a mobility restriction or an anatomical restriction is going to be key. Now, I will say this as well. Let's say you have someone that goes up, they try to perform a, a straightforward foot bodyweight squat, and they, they just can't can't do it. It looks like crap. They feel bad. I would not automatically assume it's anatomy because I do feel like a number of people have not yet realized their potential for mobility. Even if someone has femoral antiversion, femoral retroversion, they have an anatomy that's a little bit different than everyone else. You should not automatically hinge your inability to perform a deep squat solely based on that anatomy because I feel like many people still have restrictions and mobility that they need to improve in order to get a better looking squat instead of just giving up and going, well, it's my anatomy, I can't squat that way. Well, let's look at your ankles. And that's why I also give people these different screens 
you know, to try like the five inch wall test. It's a very simple thing you can do at home. Kneel by a wall, have your uh, foot five inches away from the wall. See if you can touch your knee to that wall at that distance. If you can't, there you go. You just found out that ankle mobility is a huge issue that is limiting your squat. Now, if there's an anatomical restriction that's changing things up, yes, we need to know about that. But if you just found there's a mobility restriction on the table, we for sure need to be able to address that as well. So um, you mentioned previously that feeling a certain squat doesn't really mean all that much. I'm not not sure really where am I with this topic because the mind muscle connection has been ignored for a while. And then I don't know if Brett has already published his paper or it's in review it and it's about to be published. But I know I know he was working on a study showing that the mind muscle connection, or rather feeling a muscle more, resulted in more muscle growth. Yeah, I, I'd love to read that. I I'm huge into reading like, like we talked about it before you know there's always going to be new research that comes out and you know as someone who would say that they base their um, their ideas and their concepts in evidence-based practice you know you're always going to be changing you know what we thought 10 years ago is not now necessarily what we think as far as science goes today. There's obviously different principles that apply to no matter what we're talking about in, in barbell training, but I think our ideas of how we're understanding the body and how it works is always going to be changing. You know, in, in doing so, I think we're also going to have to, you know, why we always critically appraise reach. Um, just because one or two articles come out saying that there's a connection between something, whether no matter what it is, you have to very critically understand that that article may not mean that we just throw out the rest of our evidence. Uh, for example, you know, if we look back to the early 1950s, a lot of people at the time discredited squats as being something that would injure your knees and you more prone to tearing your ACL because of the articles that Dr. Carl Klein came out with uh, down in Texas. He did some research where he made a so this sort of crude self-made device and he tested the laxity of some of his football players knees that were that were getting injured and he thought his hypothesis was that athletes who perform regularly deep squats are increasing the laxity in their knees or stretching out their ligaments or he wanted to see how you know if that was the indicator that was setting them up for injury so he found in these two articles that the athletes had more laxity in their knees and he hypothesized that it was due to the deep squats and then he put out there, you know, to everyone with these two articles, yet years later down the road in the 80s and 90s, we found that that was the exact opposite. And there was other research that was performed and found that deep squats actually increased your stability in your knee. They made it uh, more safe for your ligaments and increased how safe it was for your knees after performing deep squats. So it's important to always critically appraise uh, research, understand that we're always looking to know the body and that new evidence is always a good thing, but that we shouldn't always just hinge what one article says as, you know, confirming or completely denying a hypothesis that we had. No, definitely. Um, Because ultimately the my muscle connection is something that Jesus, millions of bodybuilders have sworn upon. And oh, for sure. In that regard, yeah, that's certainly uh, more weight than uh, an article or two. <laughs> and about this, the squat, exactly. yeah, I've seen I've seen these images. I'm sure you've seen them too. When someone has put a block or something in front of someone's knee and they have to squat without touching that uh, wood mm -hmm. thing. I just can't imagine how that must be. That's certainly a West Side style squat or something when you're just <laughs> pushing your hips back like crazy. And speaking of that kind of squat, that's very often referenced as the go-to for the glute growth. I'm not sure if you've seen them, but there are a couple of squat machines. Uh, specifically, Atlantis has one of those power squat when the angle is not up down, it's rather backward a bit. So it's an arc shape and that would yes. be something to use for glute and you just push your hips back and then you explode up and that would be the preferred uh, mm -hmm. variation by many to build up the glutes. What do you think about? Oh, definitely. You know, I think if you have, like we talked about, if you're performing a movement where it's very much so dominant on one side versus the other, for example, like a, you know, a Romanian deadlift or, you know, something like that, you're, you're obviously going to be using your glutes more so 
way more so than your quads. You know, we don't have that sort of lumbar's paradox because things are your your hips and your knees are not extending at the same rate because it's a very different biomechanical lift. So if you're using a, a machine where you're very much so pushing your hips back, yeah, it's going to be way more hip dominant. You're going to be using your glutes and your hamstrings to a much greater degree than your quads in that type of movement. For sure. Yeah, although squats have been thought of for a long time, even there are images of girls showing that, well, squat booty and <laughs> treadmill booty, you know those pictures when there's a girl with a saggy butt and then yes. the other one with a firm butt. Uh, but then hip thrusts have come along and many people still hang on to the squats for being the best exercise squats and lunges usually yeah well i think there's been a, no a number of research articles that have come out you know brett Contreras, uh he's got his website that has a lot of research on it that he's put out i think some possibly with dr schoenfield uh but you know again there's uh the hip thruster the glute bridge definitely is one of the number one recruiters if we're just talking about glute max activation so again you know it that's where we're talking about if you are if your goal is more that muscular development, the muscle hypertrophy, you know, not just choosing one exercise as sort of your primary go-to, you know, understanding that it, you know, you need to be able to use a variety of exercises, some that are more isolated than others, in really developing a full muscular hypertrophy level. Right. Just a second to uh, go back a bit to the safety squat bar because you haven't really addressed it. What do you think about that? Um, you know, it's not something that I've personally used with my patients, with my clients or anything like that. So I can't speak to it too much. I definitely think just like uh, with other types of squats, there's always going to be applications where a certain type of resistance movement is right for others more so than you know, your general uh, weightlifter, powerlifter community. So I'm not going to discredit it at all. Uh, I personally haven't used it a lot, so it's not something I can speak to a lot, but I think uh, it definitely probably has its application. And if some people, if you enjoy using the safety squat bar, you feel that it is giving you a good training stimulus, you know, I don't have a problem with that at all. Awesome. Have you seen any evidence for uh, some of the claims usually bodybuilders make that uh, you should point your toes a certain direction or you should use a certain and stance to build up uh, specific parts of your quads, usually the outer sweep or the vastus lateralis or the vastus uh, medialis or something like that? From the research that I have read, a toe angle difference does not significantly impact your quads in the development we're talking about during a squat. Um, and that's from Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, one of his research articles. So as far as that goes, well, again, what we're talking about, the anecdotal evidence, what a bodybuilder may feel, I don't think research has at all confirmed that this is true as far as the squat goes. I believe the only difference that we were able to see when a toe out angle, a different toe out angle is given is the amount that the adductors are significantly used. But as far as the hamstrings, the glutes, the quads, I don't believe research has found any difference in their activation in a straightforward foot versus a toe out angle. Yeah, one of the others I've seen on Instagram recently is the Tom Platt's X squats. If you've seen those, he would come up on his toes essentially and push through the outer part of his balls or balls of his, of his feet. <laughs> By that I mean not yeah. the other ball. <laughs> That's apparently is supposed to bring up your outer sweep more that's a bit um shady to me honestly <laughs> but uh who knows we might find out in five ten years that he was <laughs> right all along very so true, very <laughs> true. we never know we never know so um just to really round up um, this aspect of the squats and to move on to other things. Um, so what would be the final conclusion? Just pick a squat that it's most comfortable for you and that allows you to hit the most depth and the muscle growth fall where it may. And then if you have specific uh, areas you need to work on, then just pick additional exercises. Is that a pretty fair summary? Yeah, I would say that. I think, you know, your squat, the, the biggest thing is get your technique down, perform it correctly, choose the one. If you're going to just choose one, choose the one that you enjoy, that you feel that you're able to maintain the best technique and lift the most weight. And then if your goal then afterwards is to really focus on a certain muscle group, you know, then perform, choose your two or three extra uh, exercises that are very much so non-functional, very much so isolated. But then again, it's also got to, it always comes back to 
the squat has to be the backbone of that lower body development. Awesome. Another topic that uh, has recently gotten more attention is the accommodating the resistance profile of the exercise to the strength profile of your body. So, for example, using a reverse band setup to essentially take off the load from the bottom of a squat because that's where the exercise is the hardest and um, that's where you're weakest. So by doing that, you would essentially match the resistance profile of the exercise to what you're capable of. While others, for example, like someone like Mike Israel, I'm comfortable to say that he would <laughs> he would uh, think that that's a dumb thing to do because squats are the hardest at the bottom yeah but that's also where they cause the most disruptions that's where the most value lies essentially in them um what do you think about those uh, seemingly opposite uh, considerations i think you're going to get a lot of different opinions from coaches coming from an olympic weightlifting background we it's very rare to see anyone train with bands or chains you know i personally i i have used chains uh maybe once or twice for a stent uh in my career which go by again the a very similar concept the chains are heaviest at the top because they're not on the ground as you squat down more of the chain piles up on the ground and it's lighter on your body i i think the accommodating resistance it, it's a very interesting concept in that it does give you a very different training stimulus. I think you're going to get some coaches that swear by it, love the idea of how it changes the the training stimulus and how it makes different muscles work harder at different times and possibly help those, you know, bust through maybe the sticking point of a lift where they don't miss it at the bottom, they miss it about halfway up and they're unable to push that sticking point. So by using accommodating resistance, they're able to then give a very different training stimulus so that when the chains are taken away, they're able to push through it much harder. You know, again, this isn't an area of expertise for me just because I have not used them to a greater degree. I have not coached with them to a great degree. But, you know, I, I don't think there's necessarily going to be a right or wrong. And like I said, using absolutes, I'm not a huge fan of them. I think there will be some athletes that benefit from them. I think, uh, you know, there's going to be some athletes that they probably don't need to use it and they're going to get much more benefit from just training the traditional way with your plates and racks and they don't need a bands or chains or anything like that. But yeah, it, it's very interesting to see. I'd like to see more research on the topic and see, you know, how it comes out. But it's very interesting to see. I, I like learning about different things like that. And I know Dr. Mel Sif in his book, Super Training, wrote on accommodating resistance a little bit. So I would definitely check out that book. Yeah, I, uh, I think I have it on my computer, but Super Training is one of those books that everyone Everyone likes to brag about that they've read it so I'm not going to be the one I haven't <laughs> read it and yeah. I'm not going to lie about it and for what I have it's extremely technical so it is very technical so it's gonna take a while to get through yeah okay another topic that uh, I actually uh, spoke about it and Mike kind of <laughs> corrected me on it is uh, the stretch reflex I personally thought that in a squat for example it would essentially make you work less because you are essentially bouncing up but then he said well uh, what's producing the motion is the muscles so is it helpful or is it harmful for mu if so i'm not talking about performance necessarily just strictly for someone trying to build their quads up essentially are post squats in that case more effective or should they stick to a bit of a stretch reflex at the bottom it's interesting. I think you'll have to, it's going to be tough to compare them strictly because you can often lift more weight with using your regular, you know, small bounce out of the bottom. What it does, a stretch shortening cycle uses the stored energy, not in the muscles, but in the tendons. So tendons are very, very stiff. So the muscles are, yes, performing the work, but as you go down, if you'd use that little bit of a bounce, you are storing energy in the tendons, which then release the energy to come back up. So it's not actually in the muscles that are storing the energy, but actually in the tendons themselves. What sets apart pause squats or like a slow descent different is that there's more time under tension. So I think if you're strictly looking at muscular development, you have to understand a couple different things. First, how much weight's on the bar, and then also the amount of time under tension. If you are doing, let's say, you know, a squat where you're using a little bit of bounce out of the bonda, you know, you're probably lifting more weight than if you're doing a pause squat because you can't complete the pause squat with as much weight. But in doing so, lifting more weight is going to provide a different stimulus to your body. So, you know, again, I don't think this is something where there's going to be one versus the other. I think both have their added benefit. I think pause squats are great because it requires your body to overcome that stoppage in the, the movement 
you have to overcome that with your muscles. There's a lot of time under tension when you're doing a pause squat, which is going to change the stimulus to your muscles. But again, you're able to use more weight in a squat where you're using a little bit of bounce. So I don't think it's, again, like it's one versus the other. One is better than the other strictly for muscular development. I think both have their place. Right, right. Variation is the spice of life. I it think is. that's how Americans like to say it. Um, so speaking of variation, uh, what do you think about Smith machine squats? Because they have been hated on for a long time and then they kind of came back, rose in popularity, then they got shitted on again. <laughs> Where, what do you think about them? Here's the thing with the Smith machine. A Smith machine squat is, in my opinion, not a functional squat. It's not a squat in that you don't have to balance your body. It's a machine because it the bar resides on tracks. It completely takes out the need to control your body as far as it bounce. So you're not going to be having certain muscles turn on as much to adequately perform the movement. So it's like not as efficient of a movement if we're talking about creating the stimulus that's going to carry over to other lifts. If your goal is strictly muscular development, I think probably the Smith machine has some, you know, positive, you know, outcomes as far as what you can do because you can probably focus on certain muscles and change your body up and you can get that stimulus. But as far as an exercise that I think we would call a functional exercise that's going to carry over to being stronger in other lifts, being stronger in life in general, being able to go pick up a box in your garage and being able to do so safely, it's not at all a functional exercise because it, it does not require balance yeah although i so hate that term functional because there's a big gym in our town and i've seen some of their instagram videos and they put people on bosu ball and doing <laughs> this single yes. arm overhead kettlebell presses with half a kilo and labeling it functional it makes me want to drive a screwdriver in my eyes I think that's one thing that there, that's a term that a lot of people don't understand, so they misuse it. Functional means that it relates to everyday life. It's going to relate to it, its, its movement in its purest form. A deadlift is a functional exercise because it relates to not only your other training and doing a clean or doing a snatch, but it relates to picking something off the ground, picking up a box. That's a functional movement. Standing on a BOSU ball and having bands stripped all over your body People will call that, it's not functional. When are you ever doing something like that in life? So I think it's a term that's very often misused. Yeah, if you're going to define functional as something that's useful in real life, okay, I can get on board with that. But personally, I like the definition Greg Knuckles gave in one of his posts. He said something to the effect of, functional is something that improves the function you're trying to improve. <laughs> something <laughs> like that, the outcome you're trying to improve, something like that. That's funny. Yeah, I, I love that idea. Yeah, and... To me, then a sweet machine squat would be just as functional as whatever other exercise you would use to <laughs> bring up the muscle of your body. Okay, I'm aware of our time here. So one final question, and this relates to the psychology. How do you improve confidence under a bar because even myself i am honestly intimidated and i know that little girls are using more weight than i am but still when you get under a bar it, it's kind of intimidating and uh, i would imagine that practice just makes things better but are there any tips you could give because for example what i do right now even though i'm doing sets of six to eight something like that i do have a heavy ish heavy means something like 10 percent more than what i would use on my working sets for a single and then when I strip off that 10%, the weights just feel lighter. I, I think the biggest thing is just is, is having the time under the bar. There's nothing that can substitute for actually getting in and putting in the work. Show up every single day. You know, if, if you feel less confident under the, under the squat bar, squat more. Get, I mean, it's very simple. You need to spend more time under the bar. And it's not something that's built in a couple months. It's built after years and years and years of constant you know, training and perfecting your technique. And eventually it becomes second nature to be under the barbell and you feel confident with heavier weights. You know, if, if you always spend your time doing lighter weights and doing technique work at eights and tens, you know, for sure doing anything twos and threes, that's going to feel very uneasy because your body's not used to it. You know, I think that's, there's nothing more important. I think if your goal is to be more confident under the barbell, than to just spend more time under the heavy barbell and it takes time and hard work but eventually it is something that should feel or like you're making a, a positive change and it's helping carry over into your mindset awesome thank you i'm not going to ask you for your uh, 
social media accounts. I'm going to link all of those in the description of the episode of your Facebook, your Instagram, your YouTube channel, so that everyone can find the Squat University and definitely the blog because you put out just so much awesome content there. So I'm going to jump directly to the final question that I end the episodes on. And that is simply, what is your definition of success? My definition of success is being happy and content with what you have done and where you are in life. I think some people uh, measure success based on how much money they make. I think some people measure success based on how much weight they can lift. I think whatever you measure your success by, you need to be confident and uh, assured that uh, you are happy with where you're at. You know, I, I think a lot of people base their success in things that they may never attain. And I think that's a very bad way to go through life because then you're never happy. You know, I think if you are happy with, with where you're at, you are successful. Awesome. And uh, that's a great way to end uh, this episode. Aaron, thanks a lot for uh, giving up your time to do this. I highly, highly enjoyed it. And uh, I've learned a lot from it. And I'm sure many people will find a lot of value in this. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure. And have a great day. You as well. And that was episode 8 of the Muscle Engineer podcast with Dr. Aaron Horshake. I really hope you find this episode helpful and uh, will be able to take at least one thing out of it. So I promise at the beginning that I'm going to list some of my own conclusions and um, takeaway points when it comes to this whole conversation. So let's start with some of the big rocks that both of us agree on. I think it's no question that um, both Aaron and I think that execution should be the basis of hypertrophy training and barber training in general. So establishing good technique should be your first and most important priority, whichever squat variation you decide to perform. Another important point that Aaron brought up that I fully agree with is to not get caught up in trying to find the single best exercise for whatever muscle group you're trying to bring up and consider instead your overall exercise selection both within the workout and both between workouts and how all those factors might impact the squat variation you decided to use and the muscle group you're trying to improve. And finally, the importance of good ankle mobility for an efficient squat can't be overstated. Try out that wall screening method Aaron mentioned, and if you don't have at least a 5 to 6 inch or around a 13 to 15 centimeter range of motion at your ankle, I would suggest checking out Aaron's ankle mobility article on the Squat University website. Even 2 to 3 minutes of dedicated ankle mobility work per day can have huge benefits for your squatting and knee health in general. Now, let's address some of the things that I have a bit of a different perspective on. First of all, when it comes to the necessity of back squatting or barber squatting in general, insofar as you're not interested in powerlifting or getting better at squatting itself, you don't have to squat. Squatting is a very specific skill that requires a lot of practice. Whereas muscle growth is not a byproduct of squatting itself. It's a byproduct of placing the target muscle under sufficient tension for a sufficient amount of time. That can be accomplished in a variety of ways, of which squatting is one of many, but not the only one. My second disagreement is around picking a squat variation to target a specific muscle group, specifically the quads, because in my opinion that's what squats are best for. If you want to target your glutes or hamstrings, there are far better exercises to emphasize over squats. So, while the biomechanical breakdown that Aaron gave is absolutely correct, I still think from a practical point of view it makes sense to pick a squat that lets you maintain the most upright torso and get the most depth you can with the most amount of knee former travel possible, if you have healthy knees and quad growth is your goal. I also think that for muscle growth, feeling an exercise in the muscle group you're actually trying to work is a very good starting point. So for example, if you have long femurs, you have to bend over a lot to hit depth and all you get from barber squatting is a low back pump and knee pain, maybe switching to the hex squat would be a better idea and would let you work your quads more with less pain. Now, don't mistake this for me being anti-squats. I'm not. I'm just not emotionally attached to any particular exercise and I always try to pick the best tool for the job, matching the exercises to the person, instead of forcing the person into a particular exercise that may or may not suit them. The third and final point is around the whole concept of functional exercises, which Aaron defined as exercises that translate to and help improve your day-to-day -day life. Like I said in the episode, for hypertrophy, any exercise that improves the muscle group you're trying to improve is going to be a functional one. But even if we refer to improvements in daily functions, 
simply being stronger and more muscular is going to have a huge carryover and is going to offer much more benefit than doing any particular exercise in and of itself. And there have been a number of direct studies comparing leg presses and squats for example and both have improved health and well-being aka both were functional in elderly populations. So I think the main message here is to not put the cart before the horse, think of the bigger picture, What's our goal and what is the most efficient way to get there, regardless if that involves squats or not. And I think that sums up my thoughts pretty nicely and um, lists some of the key points I wanted to leave you with. So before I let you go, I want to remind all of you that if you like this episode, you can check out the previous ones too and um, you can share it with a friend or anyone who might benefit from this information. As always, feel free to get in touch with me with any feedback or questions you might have. Until next week, take care.